Amen. So let's get right into the word of God today as I am excited uh, about sharing what God has uh, uh, given to me. So I want to start here. Um, I want I want to start here. Uh, guys, I, I don't want to um, uh, throw you off, uh, but I'm, I'm learning as I get older uh, that the good things in life don't happen by accident. The good things in life really happen by by accident. And, and one of the things that I think that we, we want to make sure, and as we look at Scripture, as we talk about redoing and rebuilding and, and, and not necessarily starting over but starting back, I think one of the things we, we have to learn is the power and the importance of intention. Intention, intention. And, and I, was, I was at the gym recently. I was at uh, uh, Orange, Orange Theory I told you guys I've been trying this new thing out. Uh, I don't encourage it unless you want to work really, really hard. Uh, <laughs> it's not really what I signed up for. It was interesting. I didn't sign up for hard work. I signed up uh, to be changed. I said I didn't sign up for hard work. I signed up to be changed. And I remember when I, am I preaching already, sir? <laughs> but I remember I was in there uh, the other morning and, and, guy was telling, you know, was, man, you know, he was looking at his numbers. And, and the danger for Orange Theory for me is that they have all of your, they monitor your heart rate and everything, and they put everything on the screens. And so uh, I'm not going to lie, guys, I'm always looking at the screens, like who's doing what and, you know, uh, where am I? Because I still struggle with the spirit of comparison. Am I the only one? I hope it's not your boy. I, I still want to know, okay, I don't know who Daryl is, but I'm coming for you, Daryl. Yeah, Rebecca put me to shame this week. I'm not going to say it twice, but she did. And I remember I was talking to one of the trainers afterwards, and, um, you know, I was just talking, and, you know, she was talking about how hard I have to work, and she said, you know, um, Ryan, I didn't get this body by accident. She said to me, and I looked back at her, and I said, I didn't get my body by accident either. <laughs> Who do you think you are? I worked hard for this. I sat around a lot, tons of macaroni and cheese and Mexican food, and it was hard work. But it didn't happen by accident, hear what I'm saying. And one of the things she was trying to communicate to me is that whatever we want to see happen in our life, it demands intention. And if you're going to walk with Christ, hear me, church, it's going to demand intention. One of the things I've seen, I hear a lot, I hear people come to me, Pastor, I want a greater walk with Christ. My first question is, not what are you praying, what are you doing? Don't, don't tell me what you want, show me your intention. Show me your discipline, show me your part. And one of the things we talked about in this series last Sunday is that we have a responsibility for our own transformation. We have to take part in what we want to see. We have to position ourselves for God to work through our life, and it demands our intention, but it also demands our attention. And so one of the things I want you to think about right now just for a moment is, what are your intentions? What are your intentions? And, and a better question is, what attention are you giving to your intentions? Because we can say all day, I want to walk closer with Christ. I want to have a better prayer life. I, I, I want to know God more. I want to understand his Bible better. But if you don't have any attention towards your intentions, it will never happen. Here's what I'm learning. It won't happen by accident. <laughs> okay. It, it doesn't just, just accidentally happen. That you have a, a greater relationship with God. I'm so glad you're in church on Sunday morning. I'm so thankful that you're here. But you're going to have to put more intention than just showing up on Sunday. I'm only telling you that because I really, 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 really love you. And so today I, I want to talk about your, your intentions. But I want to talk about your attention. So I want you to write this down. Here's our main idea. Let, let's put it up there, Rob, if you can. That our intentions, if we're going to build our, rebuild our relationship with God, is going to demand our attention to our intentions. So it says this, a relationship with God is not rebuilt by accident. It is rebuilt by giving attention 
to our intention. Giving attention to our intention. Now, I believe a beautiful place that we see this is in the letter in 1 Timothy, Paul's letter to his spiritual son, Timotheus. And I believe that he actually shows us something about our intentions and our relationship with God. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verses 6 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse 6 through 10. It says this, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant. If you will put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. Being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe, those who believe. I want to preach uh, from a sermon topic today, it's not by accident. It's not by accident. Uh, I tell the person beside you, help me preach, say it's not by accident. Uh, you didn't accidentally show up here this morning. You didn't accidentally sit in the chair that you sat in. You, you had to have had some type of intention. Uh, maybe your intention started yesterday. Maybe your intention started last Sunday. But at some point, you had to choose a destination, find a path, put yourself in position to fulfill your intention. And one of the things I, I want to make sure that we do here at Vertical Church, that we, we understand, one, our intention, but number two, we understand how do we give attention to our intention. We've said it already here today that our, our mission and vision, our vision is to see 1,000 discipleship relationships uh, before 2030 that is reflective of our local community. We want to make sure as a church, this is our intention, that we make sure we pursue building discipleship relationships. So here's the question, how do we give attention to our intention? We have to put systems and tools in place. We have to be consistent with the same things. We have to say yes to certain things and no to others to give the proper attention to our intentions. Here's my question to you. With your intentions in life, are you giving the necessary attention to it? You can't tell me you want to be married and you don't give your wife or your husband attention. I thought more married folks would say amen. Uh-huh. You, you can't tell me that your desire is to be healthier in the new year and you don't give attention to your diet and your exercise plan. Move on. You, you, you can't tell me that your intention is to have a closer walk with God but you don't pray. You, you can't tell me you want to know him better, but you don't know what he already says in his word. Your, your, your attention directly is a response of your intentions. And I want to make sure if your relationship with God, your intention is to have a better relationship with God, you have to start with this thing called spiritual discipline. Ah. Ah, so let me go straight to the context here because I got more time to deal with that word. Here in 1 Timothy, Paul writes his first letter to his spiritual son again, Timotheus, who in this letter he is trying to do two things as young Timothy is a leader in the church and he is trying to help him lead people. I'll say it again. He's trying to help him lead people, not just any people, but jacked up, broken people. I don't know if y'all know this, but I read First and Second Timothy often. Y'all ain't get it. It's all right. So here it is that Timothy is broken up into two major parts. The first, first three chapters is telling Tim, Timothy the order of the church. Here is how the church should function. So in the first three chapters of 1 Timothy, he's saying, listen, this is the structure that God desires for the church. The second part of 1 Timothy, the last three chapters, is now not talking about the order of the church, but the behavior of the church. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the order of the church and as Christians and as believers and as followers of Christ, because we believe in the gospel, there should be some type of change in our behavior. There are some things that should be different about us now that we consider ourselves followers of Christ. And Paul clearly here attaches what we do as believers to engage the gospel, to follow after Jesus Christ, to, to impact everything that we do. That while Jesus offers us salvation, that we also have to pursue sanctification. Y'all remember this, that we preached on in the series, We Are the Church, that we are called to be sanctified, to be set apart for a purpose, that we are called to be holy as our Savior, Jesus Christ, is holy. If I was out in a good Pentecostal church, I would say holiness is still right. Yeah, in light of where the church was and in light of what was going on, the church was newly formed. They didn't have a lot of structure. They didn't have a lot of, a lot of direction. And so Paul writes this letter from prison and he's telling Timothy, this is what it looks like to follow Christ. And if we're going to be Christians, we have to live a certain way if we're going to be on mission. Because one of the challenges in the text that the church is having here is that they're living any old kind of way and people are not getting saved. That they're doing whatever they want to do, living any old kind of way and people are not coming to Christ. And so Paul says, listen, let me help you, one, with the order in the church because y'all need some structure, y'all need some order. But let me also tell you about your behavior. And I want to help you pursue a relationship with God. And then actually these these few verses that we get to lift up here, it actually gives us a clear picture of what it means to be a follower of Christ, and not just what it means, but what it looks like. And I think there are three things that actually Paul shows here to Timothy about his intentions, about his attention, and about the purpose of the work of those that call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. So number one, I want you to write this down. Number one, I think we see in the text that there must be an intention towards godliness. Everybody say godliness. There must be some intention about being godly. I know for some of us that's, that's a challenging thing to say. That's a challenging thing to hear that I'm supposed to be godly. Uh, I think one of the challenges for us is that we're called to be godly, but some of us act like we're God. Was it too much too soon? I'm sorry. <laughs> she said, no, I will continue. Uh, 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 some of us, are we are all called to be godly. The mistake we make is that we try to treat our lives as, as if we are God. No, Christians are not called to be God. We are called to be godly. We are called to live in light of the gospel, to live to represent, to represent Christ in every area of our life, through our decisions, through our characteristics, through our behavior, through how we treat others. It is godly to be like him through Jesus Christ. And our first intention, I want to make sure you see this, is to be godly. It's right here in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. It says this. I want you to see this. Got it? Got it on screens? Here it is. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Watch this. Rather, train yourself for what? Godliness. This is the aspiration if you're coming to Jesus and you're just trying to get an easier day tomorrow, you're missing it. If you're coming to Jesus, you're coming to church just trying to fix your problems, you're missing it. If you're coming to Jesus saying, listen, I want to continue to come to church. I want to serve because I want God to change my life. No, 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 you're coming here not so God can change your life, but I told you last Sunday, God wants to change you. And what he wants to change you into is someone that is godly. Paul says, listen, this is the behavior. He says, listen, you're going to have to train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, here it is, watch this church, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Are you pursuing being godly? See, when I came to church, I thought I had to be good. No, you're supposed to be godly. My pastor, isn't that the same thing? It depends on how you define good. Oh, man. 
Because everybody's definition of good is different. <laughs> we, how do we define our definition of good? It's always based on what? Other people. Anybody that behaves worse to me is bad. Isn't that just easier to do? Because if I make you bad, it makes me good. No, our goal is not just to be good. No, our goal is to be, everybody say, godly. We're not just saved from sin when we come to Christ. No, we're saved into the family of God. We are saved onto his mission. We are saved onto his work. We are saved as his ambassadors. And in that way, we are called to live a life a certain way. I know we live in a culture that wants to tell us that God just loves us as we are. This is true. God loves you as you are. But when he calls you, he does not allow you to stay as you are. It's right here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 20. We say it all the time. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Listen to this, church. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here it is that once you give your life to Jesus Christ, God is saying, I want to make my message, I want to send my message to the world through you. And the best way that God can send his message to the world through you is through your godliness. Listen to me, not your perfection, not the absence of your sin, not your ability to cross every T and dot every I, but your de desire to say, God, I want to represent you in every way representing God more and more uh, the more and more of his characteristics more and more of his love more and more of his grace more and more of his holiness should be the aim of every believer including you and I scripture calls this life of how we treat others how we love how we forgive how we give how we show grace how we show mercy it's a picture of God's incredible love. See, one of the ways I, I want to I define this for us is that godliness is obedient living to God in response to the love of God through the gospel. Write that down if you want to understand what godliness is. Godliness is obedient living. Everybody say obedient. That's the tough part for most of us. Godliness is obedient living to God in response to the love of God through the gospel. This is why here at Vertical Church there is a, a hard emphasis for us to make sure we share and make sure you know the gospel. Because if you don't know the gospel, there is nothing for you to respond to. So you will try to be godly to manipulate God to do things for you. God, I'm going to read my Bible praying that if I read my Bible, you give, give me what I want. That's not fellowship. That's called manipulation. Oh, has anybody ever had someone do something for you, trying to get you to do something for them? And here's the thing. When you know that's what's happening, you don't like that feeling. Why do you feel like God likes it? Let me, let me get back. I, I love one of the definitions that I, that I shared and I, and I received for godliness is that godliness is a proper response to the things of God, watch this, which produces obedience and righteous living. That your obedience to God should impact how you live your life. Another definition for godliness that I saw was that godliness is actually seeing God the right way and putting God in the right place in your life. Our aim as Christians is not to just have uh, all the things we want in life, no, but it's to reflect God's incredible love because of our new identity in Christ. Because we are grateful for this identity, it should be reflected in every decision that we make. The gospel changes everything for us before it changes anything by us. It changes my identity. It changes how I see myself. It changes how I see my neighbor. It changes how I see my enemy. And because of that, it affects every decision that I make. Because my desire and my goal is to pursue, everybody say, godliness. So godliness is our reflection. Obedience is our reflection. Our righteousness is our reflection. Our holiness is our reflection of the gospel. Matter of fact, Jesus was the ultimate picture of 
godliness. I love this. Here's a couple of pictures of this. John chapter number 8 verse 29 says this. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Watch this last part here. This is what godliness looks like. Looks like for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That's a godly life. Say, God, I, I'm doing the things I want to make sure that are pleasing to you. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 31 so, says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything that you do, that's what a godly life looks like. Everything that I do, I want to do to the glory of God. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse 15 through 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. I know this is tough because I know a lot of times we want, we want God to do something. No, you've got to be responsible. This is not going to be a fun sermon series if you want to be responsible for the things you do in your life. And we have to take responsibility. Paul says that godliness is the goal for our spiritual disciplines. I want you to hear this. This is the reason why we last year we did a whole, a whole Bible reading plan through the whole Bible. It's not just so you can know more Bible, so that the Bible can change you. We started a reading plan this year just walking through the New Testament. It's not just so you can have something to do during your devotion time. No, the whole point of it all is that you may be transformed into the image of God. That's why we pray. We don't pray to get God to do stuff for us. No, we want God to do stuff through us. See, I'm, I'm learning in my season of my life that I'm not going to God in prayer asking God to do these things for me. No, I want God to do something in me. Because this is what I've learned, that God can answer my prayer. God can do something for me, and it still not do nothing in me. I've seen people that have had God answer their prayers, and then they still won't give God glory. So what good is God answering your prayer? What good is God providing you what you asked for if it didn't change something in you? He's, he's not working that way. No, he wants to change us. Paul says godliness is the goal of our spiritual disciplines, our effort, and it's the part of our responsibilities. I want you to see this. You don't have to become godly to become a follower of Christ. But once you become a follower of Christ, you should become godly. I'll say it again. You don't have to become godly to become a follower of Christ. But once you become a follower of Christ, everything after that, you should be growing to try to become godly. This is the process of sanctification. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we experience justification because Jesus died for our sins. We walk through this life in sanctification. When we die and Jesus comes back, we'll experience glorification. But we have to take responsibility for the one in the middle. It's Jesus that did the work for justification. It's Jesus that's doing the work for glorification. But sanctification is your responsibility got to see that. Galatians chapter number 3 verse 11 says this, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. It says it's Jesus that justifies us. It's, it's his grace, but we live, we have our life by our faith in God. What does faith look like? Faith looks like obedience. I want to make sure we do this. I don't have really a lot of time to, to spend on faith. But I want to make sure we understand today that faith is not your hope. It's not your wish. No, faith is when God calls you to do something and you obey what he says. Faith is something that you live by. It's not you saying, God, I have faith that you can do this, and you can do that, and you can do this, and you will do that, and you will do this, and you will do that. No, it's saying, God, because you said this, I will do that. Okay. Faith is not you hoping God will do something. Faith is not believing God will make something happen 
for you just because you said it. No, faith is obeying the word of God. The same faith that you had when you accepted Jesus Christ and your Lord and Savior, you need that same faith every day. If we go to Hebrews chapter number 11 and we look at the hall of fame of faith, every time we see in Hebrews where they remind us of who the faithful men and the women in the Old Testament were of faith, it always connect, always connected to something they did when they obeyed God. I've had people tell me all the time, Pastor, I, I, I have the faith that God will do X, Y, and Z, okay? But what did God say? I have faith that God will get me this house, okay? But did God tell you about the house? I have faith that this marriage is going to work out, okay, praise God. I pray it does, but did God tell you to marry that person? Oh, you didn't ask. Y'all ain't going to say amen. I'm just, you just thought she was cute and she liked the same food stuff you eat. You was like, you know what? We should spend the rest of our lives together. No faith is saying, God, whatever you tell me, that's what I'm going to do. Same faith that you needed to give your life to Jesus Christ is the same faith you need to live every single day. So here, let's stop here for a second. Our goal and our desire should be godliness. Everybody say godliness. A lot of us want to be rich. God didn't call you to be rich. He called you to be godly. A lot of us want to be liked. God didn't call you to be liked. He called you to be godly. I will be honest with you, some of us, let's be honest, if God made us rich, we couldn't be godly. I ain't got time to deal with it today. Because you don't have the self-discipline. Okay, no, 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 no. God's desire is to make you godly, to be a reflection of him. And let's be honest, there are some things that God shouldn't trust me with. So maybe the goal should be you to become godly, then maybe I'll make you rich. Y'all got it out of order. Lord, if you just did this, Lord, you just know I would give it all to Vertical Church. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> you won't give what you, okay, never mind. Let's stop, let's stop, let's stop, let's stop. Point number two, let's go. Point number two, we only second sermon into the year, Ryan, settle down. Point number two, so we have to give intention to godliness, but number two, we got to have attention to training. Everybody say, attention to training. I, I love this, that Paul tells Timothy, how do you acquire godliness? How do you get to this godly place? And his word here is to train yourself. It's right here in the text, same verse, verse 7 says, having nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. I love this, that he first tells us, you can't fool with the foolishness. I can't have time to stay there. He says, rather, watch this church, train yourself for godliness. This is the most difficult part about this verse. It requires you to do it, listen to me, church, yourself. He says, train yourself for godliness. Another word that they use here, depending on what version of the Bible you have, the other word is discipline yourself. So if you want to be godly, this is not just you sitting before the Lord and say, God, make me godly, make me godly, make me godly, make me godly. No, you have to train yourself for godliness. And the question I want to ask you today, what's your training plan? What, what's your training regimen? What, what, what's your training system to develop your relationship with God? What, what's your plan to become more godly? What is your plan to become more righteous? What is your plan to better represent Christ in the earth around you? Many of us have intentions, but we don't have a plan to give attention. And he says it right here, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. Watch this, for while bodily training is of some value, let me stop here, you need to train your body. You didn't think it was in the Bible. I know, me neither. It's right there. 
Bodily training is of some value. Watch this. But godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. What's your plan to train yourself? So one of the things I love about being in discipleship groups. My discipleship group uh, recently had our first meeting for the year uh, this past Thursday. One of the things that I love about being in this D group is that we get to train, help train one of us. These are my training partners, helping me to become more and more like Christ. My job is to train and develop them. My job is to coach and to help them become exactly what God wants them to be here at Vertical Church. I told you that our intention is a thousand discipleship relationships that are reflective of our community by 2030. Our attention is discipleship groups got to see this. This is the strategy and the plan to help you become what God wants you to be. So to rob yourself of that opportunity is to rob yourself of the training. One of the great pictures I love in the Old Testament of someone that was godly was a man by the name of Enoch. Enoch is an incredible picture of what it means to live a godly life. Actually, in Genesis chapter number 5, verse 21 through 24, in Genesis chapter number 5, the uh, Genesis is actually listing out the, the generations. And actually, in verse 21, it says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he found that Methuselah, verse 22, Enoch walked with God after he found that Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 65 years. I love verse 24. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Say it again. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Say it again. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. It is believed that Enoch walked so closely with God that then when God would be on the earth and when God would be walking with Enoch that he loved him so much. There was such a tight relationship with God that God says, listen, you got to come with me. The Bible does not say that he died. And let me tell you another one. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 5 through 6. Watch this. I want you to see the tie between our walk and our faith. It says, by faith, listen to this church. It was by his faith, it was by his consistency, it was by his walk. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. His attention was around his walk with God. I want you to see this. Enoch didn't start a church. The Bible doesn't tell us that Enoch even led a discipleship group. It doesn't say he served at his church. It doesn't say he started a great business. No, what he was most known for was how close he walked with God. His spiritual discipline of being with God is what pleased God. You got to see that. It wasn't the songs that he sung. It wasn't how many scriptures he had memorized. No, it was his walk with him that pleased God. And I believe that sometimes we misunderstand what actually pleases God. I told you before, Jesus Christ did not die for you to work for you to work for him. He died so you can walk with him. Here it is, church. It doesn't happen by accident. Your spiritual development does not happen by accident. It happens with you putting in the effort. And a lot of times, let's be honest, a lot of us want the development but not the discipline. We want the output of development without the input of discipline. I know it's tough, but I got to preach the truth to you. That you can pray to your blue in the face for God to change who you are. But if you don't put in the work, if you don't discipline yourself, if you don't put in the spiritual training to help you mature in your walk with Christ, it will not happen. I said it last Sunday, we have to stop putting all the responsibility on God. So, so let me give you a spiritual exercise plan. You ready? Y'all don't want one. It's okay. If I told you you could lose 50 pounds with doing this three minutes a day, everybody had their pen and paper out, phones out recording. What's your spiritual plan? Let me give it to you right here. It's in Colossians chapter number 3, verse 8 through 9. The first thing you have to do is put off. Everybody say put off. 
we must lose our ungodliness first. Colossians chapter number 3, verse 8 through 9 says, But now you must put them all away. Put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk, obscene talk, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with this practices. Here it is. That is your responsibility. You have to put off the old self with this practices. Some of us, our biggest challenge is not learning something new, but letting go of something old. I've told you guys before that the greatest strength strength is not measured by your ability to hold on, but for some of us, our strength is me measured by what we can let go of. See, some of us are not strong enough to let go. This is some of the reason why some of us still wrestle with unforgiveness. This is why some of the reason why you see that person, you still feel a certain type of way inside because you're not strong enough not to hold on, but you're not even strong enough to let go. So you have to put off those old things. Here it is. The second thing you got to do is you got to put on. Everybody say put on. So after you put off, then you put on. You have to put on first, then you put on. Some of us would have put on on top of what you should have put off. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14, watch the text, says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. I want you to see this here, church, that both of these pictures in Colossians actually tell us how to deal with other people. You don't need kindness if you're not dealing with other people. You don't need patience if you're not dealing with other people. You don't need compassionate hearts unless you're dealing with other people. Are y'all with me? 13, watch this, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. I want you to see this right here in the text. I don't have time to deal with it too much. But it does not say that each other apologizes. says, forgive. Y'all know my philosophy on forgiveness? You understand that it has to be given. The main word in there is to give. So forgiveness is never earned. It's never deserved. It's always freely given. So I don't need your apology for me to forgive you. I want you to see, if you don't learn to put off the old and put on the new you will never pursue and actually see the things that God has desired for you. Verse 13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Here is the model, as the Lord has forgiven you, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So we put off we put on, all right, y'all write down. And the third thing in the spiritual workout plan you got, you got to press forward. Everybody say press forward. Any discipline of any kind will demand effort and work. You have to put in the work. Reading your Bible is not the goal. No transformation is the goal. Reading your Bible is just the tool to accomplish the goal. You got to see that. Praying more is not the goal. Transformation is the goal. So I pray so that I am transformed. You got to see that. Being generous is not the goal. No submitting and surrendering my heart and my resources to God is the goal that it might transform me. So the goal is not the discipline. The discipline is just the means to the goal. And we just said our intention should be godliness. So even if you pursue the right disciplines for the wrong reason, you still can miss it. So you have to press forward even when it's difficult. I can tell you that reading the Bible is not the most fun thing to do. I don't always understand it. It doesn't always make sense. But I don't do it because I enjoy it. I do it because I want to be transformed. Yes, I would rather sleep in some more. Yes, I have other things I would like to do. But because my intention is godliness and my intention is transformation, it affects my attention, which tells me I got to stay before the Lord. I have to get into his word. I got to make time to journal what God is sharing with me. I got to make time to memorize the Bible and put it in my heart that I might not sin against God. Because spiritual disciplines have never been the goal. Transformation is. 
And you can't tell me you want to be transformed if you're not willing and ready to put in the work. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse 9 through 10, it says it right here. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all peoples. Right there he says, for to this end, I want you to see this word, we toil and we strive. Toiling and striving would indicate it requires effort. It requires your consistency. It requires your persistency. He says, listen, this is not easy. I had to toil with this thing. I, I had to work hard with this thing. I had to wrestle with this thing. Y'all, uh, I remember when, when Wesley was about, about one, uh, we were just trying to get this boy to sleep in his own crib. So I'm trying to give him sleep in his own crib. And um, uh, your boy, I, I toiled. I toiled. I toiled. Uh, I tried everything that I could to get the boy to stay in his crib. I got in the crib with him. Is there anybody else that, that tried it at least once? No? Uh, thank you, too. All right. Praise the Lord for the rest of y'all gifted people. I struggled with this. It, it took effort because he was persistent, and I had to be more persistent than he was. Here's some of us. We don't always want to toil with the word of God. See, what I've learned is that the most valuable things you have to dig for. Are you willing to dig? Are you willing to get a commentary? <laughs> Are you willing to ask the tough questions of the text? See, you want something from this, but you're not willing to dig into it. Because you can't be afraid to toil. You can't be afraid to fight. You can't be afraid to press. You can't be afraid to give the effort that's needed. You're not going to see the results that you want in your own transformation until you're willing to toil and press forward. Philippians chapter number 2 verse 12 through 13 says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Paul here is talking to the church of Philippi. Work out your own soul salvation. You have to work it. You have to do something. You cannot expect the output of development without the input of discipline. I don't care how great a sermon you hear. If you don't put in your work, you won't see your change. One of the ways I think best describes uh, uh, spiritual disciplines or doing the work or, or putting the effort or training yourself is, is kind of like a, uh, I read this in a, in a book uh, called Growing Up by Robbie Gallaty. He says that one of the pictures that's, that's really beautiful about this is that there is, you have a, a power boat and a sailboat. A and a power boat, you just get in and you press the button, you start it, and you just go. But with a sailboat, you, you, you have to raise the sail. You, you, you have to do a little work to get a sailboat to go. But it doesn't go until it catches the wind. Hear what I'm saying? That you doing the spiritual disciplines is raising your sail so you can catch the wind. Y'all still ain't got it. Here it is, that you're asking God to, to breathe into your life and to speak to you and to share and give wisdom, and you haven't done the work of raising your sail to catch the wind. So listen, I, I don't make the, the boat go, but I position myself that when God decides to move, I can catch the wind, and wherever God wants to go, there I'll go. So I have to stay in my word so I can catch the wind. I got to get up and pray so I can catch the wind. I got to make sure that I keep a humble heart and serve one another so I can catch the wind. I got to be generous with what God has given me so I don't make idols what's already in my pocket so when God moves, I can catch the wind. See, the question you have to ask yourself is what are you doing to catch the wind? Maybe the wind of God is blowing, but you haven't done the spiritual work. You haven't put in the effort to raise your own sail to catch the wind. Okay, okay. What are you doing? Jay, let, let me get that ball right there, bud. Let me, let me get that ball you got there. Oh, you got it. Oh, oh, it's all the way over here. Praise God. I want you to see something that's really important for us to, 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 to grab with this idea uh, of catching 
what God has. Well, since you're up here, stay right there. Yeah, he, you just signed up for it. Come on, come on up here, brother. You done messed yourself up today. <laughs> At least your wife dressed you this morning, so it's all good. <laughs> oh, you got your ankles out and everything. Come on, boy. So I want you to see this. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Uh, I want you to see this. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm about to be that guy. 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 Let's go. Okay, cool. Stay right there. There was something that Jordan had to do before he caught the ball. What, what did he have to do? Anybody tell me what, what did he have to do? He had to do what? Position himself. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's get it back. Ah, all right. Okay, we're going to try it again because I want y'all to see this because a lot of times God is trying to do certain things and you're not ready. Come here, here, this, throw it, throw it, Jordan. Uh, oh, man, that, that's a good illustration. I like that. Because some of us, we're not ready, and we miss it, and then we drop it, and God got to go back and pick it back up. In 2020, he tried to give you something he should have gave you in 2019, but you didn't do the spiritual work of reading your Bible. See, this is what I used to love. I used to play baseball. My dad went to college on a baseball scholarship, so baseball was kind of his thing. And he played left field, so I played left field. And so one of the things I learned about playing baseball in the outfield, whenever somebody hits the ball out, there's a responsibility to the outfielders to catch the ball. But before they catch the ball, the first thing that they do before they catch it is they point at it. Oh, man. They, they go get in what? Position. They point and they say, I got it. Because they're positioning themselves to receive something. And here it is that God wants to bless you with understanding, with wisdom, with insight to transform you. But if your hands aren't ready, spiritual discipline puts you in position to catch whatever God is trying to put into your life. So you can ask God all day, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. But if you haven't put your hands up to catch it, you won't receive it. Maybe this is why when you read your Bible, it doesn't make any sense. Have you put in the work? See, uh, we, we start our missional community back this, today at 530 at my house. And so our missional community is coming over. Shout out to the Durham missional community. God bless you. Uh, and one of the things that we do is we walk through scripture. We walk through the sermon. And a few times I've had people say to me, Pastor, how is it that you just kind of look at this and you can pull stuff out of the text? You can just see things. It's not because I'm special. I'm not better than anybody else in this room. I am a proud owner of an Orange County Schools public school education. Praise God. But here it is. Hear what I'm saying. It's because I have put the work in. It's not that God miraculously speaks to me and gives me these special things. No, no, no. I've sat down with the word. I've sat down in scripture. I didn't start this the week I started working the sermon. No, this has been happening for years in my life. I didn't get here by accident. I've served. I've been generous. I've been faithful. I've fallen. I've gotten back up. But I stayed faithful to what God wanted to say to me there's nothing in this book that you cannot pull out yourself if you don't take time to get in it God wants to speak to you the same way he speaks to me but you have to position yourself the Bible says that Jesus Christ died on the cross and the veil was rent from top to bottom and every man became a priest unto himself, which simply means that everybody can go to God for themselves. You don't have to come to your pastor to hear a word from the Lord. No, if you have a relationship with God and you put your hands up to catch what God is willing to say to you, God will speak to you about your life for your life. It does not happen demands an intention and it demands attention. The growth track, we're starting this week. In a couple of weeks, uh, we, we're doing one on basis of the Bible. I, I'm trying to help you understand how to read the Bible. It hurts my heart that more people don't pursue the growth tracks here. Let me be honest with you, it hurts my heart because we put a lot of time and energy and effort preparing those. Here it is, to help position you <laughs> to help position you to see what God wants for you in your life. 
so you can read your Bible, so you can pray, so you can make disciples, so you can understand the foundation of the gospel. This is the work of the church. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to make you godly. I'll say it again for the people in the back. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to make you godly. Ephesians chapter number four. Go read it. Verses 14 through 19. I told you that's my job description. To equip the church to do the work of the ministry. I want you to be exactly what God wants you to be. When I teach a growth track, I'm leaving my family at home at night to come equip you to do the work of the ministry so you can be transformed. Here it is. I know that it doesn't just happen on Sunday morning. So if I know that and believe that as your pastor, shouldn't you believe that as well? What's your training plan? Where is your attention? Lastly, right here, here's, here it is right here. Paul closes with this. Our intention, our attention, he says, here's is what it's all for. Here's what it's all for. For the mission, for God's mission. It's all for God's mission. Right here in verse number 10. We're closing right here. Watch this. It says, for to this end, what's the end? People's lives being changed. What's the end? The gospel being proclaimed and preached. What's the end? The truth being told about you. What's the end? That people be set free. What's the end? That people be healed. Right there, verse 10. For to this end we toil and strive. Here's why. Because we have our hope set on the living God. Who is what? The Savior. Savior. He's the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Our faithfulness to our spiritual disciplines, our spiritual formation, our development and maturity, is so we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. So that more people can be healed that are broken. There are so many broken people in our world, discouraged, depressed, suffering. believing the lies that their past has told them. Believing the lies that culture has told them. Church, we have to train. I told you before that the church is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. We have a mission. We have a work we have to do. People's lives, people's souls are in the balance and God has called us as his followers to pursue this work of redeeming them, to pursue this work of reaching them, for pursuing this work to get them back in the healthy relationship with God. And we have to train ourselves if we're going to do that. It doesn't happen by accident. Colossians chapter number 1 verse 28 to 29, our last verse. It says, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Here it is. It's my heart right here as your pastor. That we may present everyone mature in Christ. Don't get it twisted. Just because you've been going to church a long time does not mean you're mature in Christ. I'm glad you're older, mother. Doesn't mean you're mature in Christ. If you haven't been transformed, doesn't mean you're mature in Christ. Verse 29, I heard the word again. For this I toil, struggling, watch this, with all, catch this, his energy. That he powerfully works within me. This is what I love about this church. You got to hear this. That you're striving, making a commitment to, to stay in your word, to read your Bible, to serve, to be generous, 
thanks be to God, it's not in our own strength and our own energy. We can call and depend on the Holy Spirit to empower us to remain faithful. I believe God wants to transform you. But you got to be disciplined to do the work. Are y'all with me? Here's what I love about Jesus Christ. The gospel tells us that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said to the Father, Lord, not my will, but thine will be done. Jesus pressed forward when they lied on him. He pressed forward when they betrayed him. He pressed forward to continue in the work. The Bible says that often Jesus went away to go be with the Father to pray. The Bible says right before he he died, he gave up his life when he was arrested. The Bible says that he was praying so hard that he was sweating like it was blood coming down from his forehead. It's because Watch this, that salvation was not going to happen by accident. And if salvation doesn't happen by accident, sanctification doesn't happen by accident. I love this, that we see in Acts, Jesus tells us that, he tells the disciples, listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. He's saying heaven not going to be an accident. 